This is my channel's weekly compendium, ending Monday, September 18th, 2023. Case file number 1278, written by Rocco152, The Fatherly Time Warp Chronicles. I was pulling an all-nighter with my now ex-girlfriend in the living room at my parents' house when we lived there. It was around 5 a.m. and my dad walked out of his bedroom and passed us to head to work. He stopped and chatted for a couple minutes, but he seemed different. I couldn't quite tell how, but he just seemed a little off, so I chalked it up to him being extra tired. He leaves the house. Not even 10 minutes later, and he comes out of his room to leave for work? You know those scenes in movies where the protagonist witnesses some catastrophic event and the shot focuses on their bewildered face while they gasp and mouth, Oh my god! That was me at that moment. My entire body went numb, and I started panicking. I don't know why, but it really messed my head up. I asked if he just left and came back, but he said he just woke up and he didn't seem off this time, he was normal. Still can't explain what it was. Wasn't like asleep since I've done the all-nighter thing several times before and after with nothing similar ever happening. I don't expect to know and I honestly will not search for answers. I chalk it up to a glitch in the system or a divergence from one timeline, reality, strand, whatever. Who knows? I sure as hell don't. Bonus file written by Omnipotent Albatross. When laundry machines go wild. For the first year and a half of college, I worked the evening shift, 3 to 11, in a small town hotel that was run by my best friend's mom. The laundry room was connected to the main office, and since it came out into the middle of the hallway, we usually used it as a shortcut if we were going to check on a guest room. Everybody would leave by 8pm, and the evening shift would work the last few hours alone. We primarily served week-long business stays, so it was pretty quiet. My first day alone, a housekeeper was teasing me about a ghost that haunted the hotel. I laughed it off. That night, when I was alone, I used the laundry room as a shortcut. I was halfway through the laundry room when all of the washing machines and dryers kicked on at the same time. I flew out of the room. I never really mentioned it to anybody, and in the back of my mind I told myself that maybe everything had been sent on a timer or something. I never had any more issues until a year and a half later on my last day of working there. Earlier in the week, I had an unsettling experience with a guest. He was embarrassed to borrow a plunger. He returned it by coming in through the unsecured laundry room, came all the way into the back office, and left the plunger in the middle of the room. He intentionally came in very quietly and never announced he was in the office or anything. I just turned the corner from the front desk and found the plunger in the middle of the room. Due to that, I had shut the door between the laundry room and the office. It was my last hour of work, and I suddenly heard what sounded like three drunk men arguing in the laundry room from the other side of the door. It was so loud and I kept hearing the clink of beer bottles, but I couldn't understand what they were saying. I called my best friend, who worked the night shift and was the manager's son. He could hear the voices arguing through the phone too. The situation felt so surreal and even though I objectively knew it was a dumb idea, I opened the door to tell the guys to go to bed. As soon as I opened the door, the voices stopped and the room was completely empty. I blew it off, but it was so weird that my first and last day involved such strange experiences. Bonus file written by K.R. Steele When Revenge and the Supernatural Collide I went to a boarding school, as my dad was in the military, and for a few years he was moved around way more than the normal every three years. It was full of other kids in that sort of situation, so it was a bit rougher than what people usually think of when they hear boarding school. There was a lot of bullying and fighting. We would also make up stupid ghost stories to scare our dorm mates. One of them was about this former pupil called Peter who went crazy and killed the teacher before running away. There were woods nearby and a few caves. It was said that he lived in one of them and would sneak back into the school to steal food and clothes from the dorms. There used to be a challenge to go to the caves near dark and run into the largest one and touch a stone outcropping that was just before the cave took a turn off the side. Hardly anyone had the balls to do it. One day, 
Me and some of my friends were messing around near the caves. I was playing with one of my toys that I brought to school. It was a slightly repainted G.I. Joe salvo figure with a new head I'd swapped in because I didn't like him bald. Some of the kids who used to give us a hard time sort of snuck up on us and gave us the usual beating. Then one of them threw my toy into the cave, laughing at how Sneaky Pete would have fun with it. After they left, I tried to go in and find it, but couldn't, and I ended up getting freaked out. This ate away at me for weeks, so I planned my revenge. The bullies would usually always go to the cave after dinner to challenge a few kids to go in to prove they were cool. I snuck away from dinner early and got changed into all black clothing and a ski mask. I waited till I could hear the kids coming, then snuck into the cave, right to the back, behind the stone, and waited. They stood outside for a while, but eventually, one of the bullies tried to prove how tough he was by going to touch the stone. I waited till he got real close, then jumped out and yelled. Everyone started screaming and running in all directions. I felt pretty good. Strangely, my revenge had overcome any fear I had. I didn't really think that I was there in the cave, alone in the dark. Anyway, the scary bit is on the way back. I put my hand in my pocket and found my G.I. Joe. It chilled me to the core. Now I know that I probably just found it there and subconsciously put it away while I was focused on the scare, but I have no memory of it, and I had changed my clothes before coming to the cave. It still gives me the creeps. Case file number 1279, written by Anonymous. The picture that cannot exist. It was summer 1975, and we visited the Magic Kingdom on a weekend. Back in those days, Disney was working the ticket system. You paid to get in the park, and at the same window, you bought tickets to be used within the park. The tickets were designated A through E, with an E ticket being for the best rides in the park. As I recall, It's a Small World was an A ticket ride, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride was a C ticket ride, and much later, Space Mountain would be an E ticket ride. In our group was Dad, Mom, my sister Kim, and I. We had a great day and documented the trip with our Polaroid SX-70. A word about how our family worked. Dad was the photographer, period. No one would ever use a camera except for him. However, I, age 13, took the underdeveloped photos and fanned them until they developed. I was the man. If you do not remember how these cameras worked, please Google it. We thought they were great. After lunch, we were walking by the Jules Verne's 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea ride, and I wanted to go on it. I had my e-ticket, but Dad stopped me short. He was, as usual, short and sharp. Son, think for a minute. That ride submerges under the water. We're not going on it. Think for a minute. I heard that come out of his mouth at least 500 times in my life. Why, Dad? What if it breaks while we're submerged? Me, derisively. Um, okay, right, Dad. Son, when it comes to machines, it's an imperfect world. Things break all the time. What if the mechanic for that ride had a bad day yesterday? We are not going underwater on that thing. And that was that. I was a bit crestfallen, and Dad tried to throw me a bone. He offered to take a picture of the Nautilus as it cruised by. So I was mollified. After all, it was a chance to fan an undeveloped photo. Mom and Kim dropped back, and Dad went to the rail. We watched as he bent over the rail facing the lagoon and snapped a shot of his submarine as it traveled by on its underwater rail. Out popped the white photo with a weir and a click, and he handed it to me to fan. I did so, and we walked on, me contentedly fanning another photo. In a moment, I looked at the developed photo and for a moment I did not understand what I was looking at. I called Dad over and showed him. In the photo was the lagoon, the Nautilus, a black area on the right, and the back of my father's head? Wait, what? The back of my dad's head was in the picture? Impossible! He leaned over the rail and snapped the shot himself. We watched him do it. There should have only been the sub and the lagoon in the frame. It was as if I had held the camera over my head behind him and snapped a picture, 
but that had not happened. Remember, only Dad was the photographer, no exceptions. I watched Dad take the photo while leaning over the rail. So did Mom. It was genuinely an image which could not exist, and yet there it is. Dad looked at the photo and said, Well, crap, Kidoski. Told you we weren't going on that ride. Kidoski was his nickname for me at times. Dad was a product of his era, early adulthood in the 1940s, show no weakness. He appeared to shrug it off, but years later, Mom would tell me that he later broke down and cried in front of her and asked what it could have possibly meant. Was it a message about his mortality? He would die six years later of mesothelioma, but I never connected the two incidents in my heart. After all, we all have a shelf life. I give you an impossible photo that Mom, Kim, and I watched be taken. What appeared on the print should not exist. To this day, 46 years later, it remains one of the true mysteries in my life, and now you all know about it. Creepy File Number 118, written by Bart. The Malignant Whispers. I was young, maybe 12 or 11. My sister, 14, and I were alone in the house playing the card game Rummy on our living room floor while she was complaining about her boyfriend at the time. We were listening to a Gloria Estefan tape. This was a long time ago, don't judge. Just when my sister's complaining was reaching a high point, the tape's music faded out, and then all of a sudden you could hear a man's voice screaming at us through the speakers. Shut up! I'm sick of hearing it! Then the music faded back in. We were panicking. We ran to the couch on the other side of the living room, as far away from the stereo as we could get, and huddled together while crying like babies. She ended up calling her boyfriend, of course, to come over. After she hung up with him, the tape faded out again, and this time, a woman's voice came up over the speakers and said, No matter how hard you try, no one's coming for you. This time, we lost our damn minds. We ran out of the front door and down the stairs to the yard to wait for our savior. We told our mom, and she said that the stereo must have picked up a CB radio or something, but we told her that we were listening to a tape, not on the radio. The function that can pick up the outside radio waves wasn't even on. When we replayed the tape later, it was just music, so no one taped over anything. The neighbor that lived downstairs was an older man from a different country, with a heavy accent, and his even older mother who didn't speak our language at all. The other neighbors on either side of our house couldn't have possibly heard my sister complaining, she wasn't yelling or even speaking much louder than a basic tone anyway. It was one of many strange and scary things that happened in that house. Case File Number 1280, written by Mr. Hella Fresh. I dodged the Grim Reaper's scythe. I was 18 at the time, having just finished high school and went with my friends to the beach on our motorcycles. 18 is a legal driving age. A friend had just gotten his bike modified and recommended that I take it for a spin. Stupid 18 year old me said sure, left my helmet behind and got on with shorts and a t-shirt. Note here that it was the second time driving that bike and it had no ABS, automatic braking system. I was driving for like 10 minutes on a straight country road and eventually decided to head back. On my way there, I was really speeding, stupid 18 year old me, and decided to overtake the car in front, gear down revving, and just as I'm approaching to overtake, the driver decides to do a U-turn out of the blue. I do not recall much from my reaction. I slammed on the brakes and then saw a sort of flashback of my family's faces thinking that I would never see them again. Then, some seconds later, I realized that I stopped, literally a yard or two away from the driver's door, and she was eyes wide, staring frozen at me. I recalled the time of overtaking the car and my speed, and honestly, I cannot tell how I did not die there. This changed my life, the way I think, and gives me the chills every time. Case Fall Number 1281, written by Chili Dog. My lost license materialized five years later. In 2009, my wallet and Blackberry were stolen at a gas station. I replaced my cards then move on with my life. In 2014, I got a new to me truck. It was a 2012 fleet truck with about 30,000 miles. 
and I was pretty happy with it. It had been a Comcast truck in the next state over, and was in pretty good shape and had an awesome utility box on top. The dealership was near my parents' house, so I took it there, and my dad and I were combing through it finding things like the spare tire jack and stuff. We found my driver's license under the passenger seat. I figured I'd forgotten to put it away at the dealership and it fell on the floor, so I opened up my wallet to put it up. I had a license in my wallet. The license that was under the seat was the one that was stolen in 2009, in a truck from a different state that hadn't even have been built at the time of the theft, and I just happened to purchase this truck five years later. Case file number 1282, written by Satch1987. Tinsel, eggnog, and ghosts. We used to have a night out every Christmas with the lads from high school. We went back to one of the lads' house and were all drunk having a good time, when one of the lads pointed into the kitchen and said, Who's that? The kitchen was like a box room where you could see the whole room from the doorway. I had my back to the wall where it was and turned to look in. The lights were off and there was no one there. We all looked and said, what are you looking at? He was adamant and just pointing and just said, no, who are those two there? The lad whose house it was was looking in and turned on the light and again, there was no one there. And we all said, are you okay? What are you on about? He said, look, that fella is leaning on the worktop and the other is leaning and pointing and laughing at me. We all kept saying there was no one there. After back and forth for about 10 minutes, he was describing what they were wearing, etc. And then the lad who could see these people realized we couldn't and started freaking out, tearing up and shaking uncontrollably, saying he had to get out of the house. He was shaking that much that we had to put his shoes on for him. Once he had gone and been drunk, no drugs that we knew of, we just laughed it off as him being off and on one, but the lad to whose house it was said he described his uncle and granddad who had been long since dead, exactly how they used to stand and what clothes they were wearing. I wouldn't have believed it if I wasn't there. And honestly, I still think he just had a mad episode. We have all met his granddad and uncle before they died, so it could have been some mental moment he had. To this day, any time we mention it, he refuses to talk about it and doesn't even entertain any notion of it. Like I said, it sounds far-fetched, but that it is 100% true. I don't believe in ghosts, etc., and still think he had a moment, but it was genuinely weird and unsettling. Bonus file written by Anonymous. My Feline Angel's Final Cuddle. I was living in Boston. I was woken up at 3 a.m. or so by my cat jumping on my bed and curling in between my calf muscles and going to sleep. My cat has done this every night since I was 5 years old. That was his spot. It was something I was very familiar with. Thing is, at the time, my cat was living with my parents on the west coast, so I couldn't understand what the hell I just felt. But I knew it was my cat, I just figured I was dreaming. I got a call from my parents the following morning that my cat died around midnight the previous night, three hours behind since I was on the east coast. Guess that was my cat traveling to Boston to come see me one last time. I wasn't dreaming, I remember it quite well. I said maybe I was dreaming because I am doubtful of myself, but thinking back, yeah, I was wide awake and realized my experience. Despite being a fun believer in ghosts, Suspension of disbelief. I haven't had any other experiences other than this. This is my own experience, and I expected and appreciate the doubt. But call it what you will, my cat came to see me. Case file number 1283, written by Necra Me. Hole in Spacetime versus Heroic Dog. Lived on a 600 acre farm in Arkansas. Absolutely no one around for miles and miles and miles was out feeding the animals after getting home late one night, just finishing up and taking the buckets back out to the barn. As I was locking up the feeding barn, we had a herding dog, it was a corgi, it was just going absolutely nuts and running into the woods, so I instantly went to investigate to make sure that the animals would be alright. Had a handheld spotlight, shining it into the woods, saw nothing. The dog was just going absolutely nuts, still and I finally saw him running between these trees towards this like, black splotch? 
was it somewhat humanoid shaped? But it went in at it and the things just seemed to absorb the light. I've never seen anything like it. Closest would be like an opaque stone, how it doesn't reflect the light but just kind of nullifies it. Regardless, the dog suddenly was tossed up over my head, over the electric fence which is above 6 feet in height and at least 9 feet back towards the fence. I absolutely booked it back to the house to get the shotgun and when I came back the dogs were still barking but the thing was gone? So I shot the shotgun in an attempt to scare whatever it was away and it seemed to have worked so I didn't see it again. Dogs all come back to the house, feed and water them. Give them all the good boy treats for protecting the animals. Now here's the part that made it mega hard to cope with and it really, really upset me. The next day, that specific dog who chased in after whatever this was, wound up dead with its neck snapped completely backwards on the edge of the woods. I was in shock and grief at the time. I didn't really think about it, but still to this day I have no idea what that was and the thought of it just makes me sick to my stomach. Case file number 1284, written by Weesh. Did I predict my friend's words? I was in ninth grade and my friend, Donna, invited me to accompany her and her parents to a barbecue at the up north vacation home, it's a Michigan thing, of one of her relatives. I'd never been there before, had never met these aunts, uncles and cousins. There was a badminton net set up on the property. And since Donna and I had recently had a badminton unit in gym class, we went into the storage unit slash pole barn to search out the rackets and shuttlecocks. At one point while she was digging through sacks of stuff, she commented something like, I think, cousin, Karen's husband is kinda creepy. The thing was, I looked directly at Donna and spoke that line completely in unison with her. I'd had a very sudden flash, as if I'd been in this exact place in this situation before and knew what she was going to say as soon as she paused and looked up at me. Donna of course was stunned and asked me how I knew what she was going to say. Déjà vu, I replied, still trying to understand it myself. She was unfamiliar with the term other than the literal translation. Already seen? She asked. I tried to explain that I didn't know if I'd seen the scenario in a dream or what, but she was weirded out by it as was I. Case file number 1285, written by Solemn Luna. Space time as a pretzel. Lots of weird stuff has happened to me in my life. So either I'm haunted by some trickster god type of crap, or stuff just tends to get strange naturally around me, and I'm too stupid to figure out what's going on. I've chosen three things that I absolutely can't explain, and had other people witness it too. The first story takes place at a friend's apartment around 15 years ago. We were watching TV and just talking, and the subject turned to ghosts for some reason. I told her that I believed that there was something more in this world that we still didn't understand, but she just laughed and said that she never believed in that kind of stuff and never would. She then shouted for the ghosts in the room to show themselves, just to mess with me. She waited, smirking, for a few seconds, and then we heard what sounded like a heartbeat, like rhythmic thumping. We looked around for a second and found the source almost immediately. It was my purse. It was laying on the table in front of us, pulsating like a heart. I grabbed it and emptied it, but we couldn't find anything that could have caused a weird heartbeat. The second story takes place around the same time, but in another friend's house. He had told me on several occasions that he often heard footsteps in his living room, but I figured that it was probably creaky floors or pipes since it was an old house. But one night when my sister and I were at his place, we heard them as well. It was clear as day. Someone was walking in heavy boots it sounded like from his kitchen into his living room and stopped right in front of the couch we were sitting on. The last story happened to me and my dad when I used to live with him and my sister. My dad and I were sitting in the living room and watching a movie one night. My sister was in her room studying. When I sat in the living room, you could see the hallway to the left that began in my sister's room, went past the living room and all the other rooms and ended up at the office where the family computer was. Both me and my dad saw my sister walk past from her room to the office. We both turned and looked at her. Two minutes later, we saw her again, walking the exact same direction. Me and my dad looked at each other and he pointed out how weird it was that we never saw her go back the other way. 
and if he saw her again, he would ask her what she was doing. And sure enough, a few minutes later, she walked again from her room to the office. My dad called out for her and asked her if she was in the office. She then walked out of her room again and said no, why did he ask? We have no idea who or what we saw that night, wandering the same route again and again, repeating, and my dad still considered it the weirdest thing he's ever experienced. Case Notes File 1286, written by Joyce's Raven 13 A Physicist's Perspective on Quantum Immortality I've always been confident of my experiences and observations. That's been something about myself I've always liked. There are plenty of things that I'm awful at, but I've built a career in anthropology on observing things other people don't see until I've pointed them out, and I trust my perceptions. Despite this innate confidence, however, it has been validating to find out that other people have had the I died and jumped timelines experience, too. My own experience finds its seeds in the absolute worst period of my life, an 18th month span that started in the spring of 2015. I'd been through hard times as a homeless youth after having to leave home and school at 16, but just before the events that exploded in 2015, I was having a good life. I was married to someone I loved deeply, I had a great career, great friends, and enjoyed volunteering for my community by teaching martial arts to survivors of DM violence and running a special needs animal sanctuary on my land. Unfortunately, over the course of this 18 month span, both of my parents were diagnosed as terminal with rare and terrible brain conditions. I started caring for them, traveling constantly to take my mom to chemo in another state and helping my dad find new ways to communicate as he lost his ability to speak. In the midst of this, my wife left me for a student of mine whom she'd been having an affair with. Crushingly, my service dog had to be put down a week after my wife left after she had an intractable seizure. Then, the worst thing happened, or the worst two things I suppose. My dad died and I was assaulted the same night by someone who was supposed to be there to support me. The assault was so bad that I had to have two surgeries and I ended up literally losing parts of myself. I included all of this to give context to the next part. The day after I got home from my second surgery, I remember only two things. The first was posting on social media that I needed to place all the animals at my sanctuary. The last was smiling strangely at myself in the bathroom mirror later that day. Then nothing. I woke up late the next day, around 4pm, sicker than I have ever been. I had the worst headache ever and I started vomiting. I pushed myself along the floor to the bathroom. For quite a while, an hour or two, maybe more, I laid on the bathroom floor, unable to move. I finally got up and lunged my way to the kitchen, thinking that I needed to hydrate or I wasn't going to make it, confused as to why I felt so awful. As I dizzily tried to stand and clumsily grabbed a glass from the cupboard, I saw it. There on the kitchen counter was an empty bottle of the strong pain medication that had been full when the hospital sent it home with me after my surgery the day before. I had a horrible, sinking feeling. I realized that I had taken the whole bottle. There had been 60 pills. I immediately thought that there was no way I could have lived through taking that many pills, yet there I stood. The fact that I didn't even remember doing it was alarming. It did explain the nausea and headache and being out of it to the point that I couldn't even care for the animals, which never happened even if I had to crawl. I was shocked. Yes, I had been through hell over the last months, losing so much, but in addition to the 26 animals that I loved dearly and who depended on me, I was still very close to my sister and had a grown child who meant the world to me. I would never have consciously made a decision to end things. Nevertheless, the proof that I had reached a limit to what I could handle sat there on the counter, the empty bottle staring at me like a dead eye, open wide. In the immediate aftermath of this event, I felt like I had inexplicably dodged a bullet, defying death. I went to counseling and found other supports for my grief and exhaustion. I tried to get back to a semblance of normality. However, things never did feel right. The people who've experienced quantum immortality know exactly what I'm talking about. 
There was an undeniable dissonance between me and what was supposed to be my life. I knew that something had drastically shifted, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Nothing seemed real. It wasn't dissociation, it was like I had suddenly been set down a whole different life, one that was thinner. I use that term because it almost feels like I was a ghost. I remember that the thought started pushing into my mind that I hadn't dodged a bullet, but that I had actually died that fateful day and was living in some sort of second reality. Not knowing about quantum immortality at this point, I did research on believing that you are dead and found out that there is a very rare condition in which people inexplicably believe they are dead and slowly rotting away. I think it's called Cotard Syndrome. I didn't feel like I was dead exactly, and I didn't feel like my body was decomposing, but I grasped at the idea that maybe that was what was going on with me. It wouldn't be surprising if my mind was off kilter after all that had happened. I just needed time. It slowly became clear though that it was far more than that. At first, it was small things. I didn't remember certain events or interactions or remember them the right way according to friends and acquaintances. I realized that I felt differently about people I had known for a long time, more positively or more negatively. My tastes and preferences changed. Still, I knew that a near-death experience could cause changes in personality, so I continued to push away the idea that I had somehow jumped into another timeline to the periphery. Push it away as I might though, an awareness that something foundational had shifted was beginning to override traditionally rational assessments. Though I had kept it to myself, and even continued to try to contain it in my subconscious, I started thinking in terms of my prior life being on one timeline and the one I'm living now being on a different one. As I leaned into finding happiness despite this undercurrent of disruption, I got together with someone I had a deep attraction toward over several decades. In my lifetime before, we had never had an opportunity to date because we were always out of sync in dating other people whenever our lives crossed paths. But in this timeline, we were both free when we ran into each other again and we finally had our chance. I remember thinking to myself that maybe this is why I switched timelines, to have the relationship with her that we had always been meant to have, though I kept that buried in my private thoughts. It was during the early part of our relationship that the first major jolt occurred that forced my buried thoughts to the surface. I knew something was profoundly and irrefutably off when I mentioned to her the trip she and I took to see my family 15 years before. She looked at me like I was from Neptune. She had no memory of the trip at all. She said I must be thinking about the trip that we took right before she left for college when we were kids, when we had taken an initial trip to introduce her to my family when I first fell for her. But the second trip I was talking about occurred when we were in our 30s and 40s. At that time, our lives had come together unexpectedly again, and we had contemplated dating, as she was in an open relationship and my relationship just prior had ended. The purpose of the second trip was to reintroduce her to my family after so many years and for her and I to have a chance to talk about our possible future. I remember her getting into my family's town on the train, how nervous I was, picking her up, what she wore over the course of the trip, the products that she was using at the time, for example, a rose water spray for her face. I remember the special and specific dishes that my mom had made for us. My mom's cooking history is very distinct as people in the family changed their dietary needs and convictions over the years. I even remember that this woman was not used to eating the kinds of foods my mom made and got a terrible stomach ache. She had laid on the floor and put her legs up on a particular post in her house to try to alleviate the cramping as I did what I could to help her feel better. I remember the exact spot where we made out on the hill next to my parents' house and exactly everything we talked about as we were sitting there, as it was the first time I'd kissed her and it was obviously a memorable moment. I remember timing things so that I could ride the train back with her when she left. I remember the train ride home with her on the second trip and how there was hardly anyone on the train, so we each got to spread out and have our own seats. After the first trip, she left alone and I traveled to Illinois with my mom. We talked long and seriously about starting a relationship but made the decision that the timing wasn't right, as my son was still quite young and needed my full attention. 
Though she remembers our lives crossing paths again at the time, she had no memory of the second trip and all of the things that transpired during it. She kept insisting that I must be remembering the first trip, despite my ability to reel off all kinds of distinguishing details about the second trip that proved it had to have happened later. I kept telling her that the first trip was quite distinct in my memory, and our memories matched in regard to the details of the first trip. All to no avail. We simply had different memories. Further, my family had no memory at all of her making that second trip to see them, either. Her sister, who she shares everything with, also has no memory of the second trip. As we talked more about our memories of the many times we wove into each other's lives over the decades, things we did together, talked about, there were all kinds of discrepancies between our memories. Beyond very different memories of our lifelong relationship, it was plain that in this timeline, we just weren't compatible. Though we finally had the chance to be together, we just weren't resonating, and sadly, we broke our engagement. Soon, after our heartbreaking parting of ways, I went to visit my sister, who always made me feel better. We hadn't had much time to reminisce over the last years, with our parents' illnesses, my dad's death, my romance and its end, and so forth. It was nice to have a chance to talk about our shared history. As we chatted, I commented on the lion collage that I had made for her, which was hanging over her desk. I was sharing my very clear memories of cutting up my dad's many camping catalogs and making different shapes to create this big lion collage for her. I laughed about cutting a whole tent out of a catalog to use as a nose. I said that every time I looked at it above her desk now, I would feel the same slight twinge of annoyance I felt when I made it, realizing that a couple of the lines were off. But my sister looked at me, obviously perplexed, and said that she had equally clear, detailed memories of her and my dad making the collage together as they sat at his desk in our old house. I finally told her about my growing awareness that my memories were not all gelling with the people around me. She had already had a glimpse of this when we discussed the trip that never happened with my ex fiance but now I really opened up about feeling like I was living a different, second life since that fateful day. She knew me and believed what I was saying. We started going through various important family memories, first just the two of us and then the whole family, and it quickly became clear that I had all kinds of different memories than they did. I'm lucky that they were all open-minded and supportive of my experiences. Still, it has been a difficult adjustment. It feels like I've lost an entire lifetime. I really feel for the people here who have gone through this. It creates a terribly unique kind of grief, and there is absolutely nowhere to process it unless you find other true personal accounts like the one shared here. The stories other people have shared about experiences similar to mine have meant so much. Once I learned about it, quantum immortality made a great deal of sense to me. I am an amateur physicist, particularly enthusiastic about theoretical physics and I can see where my experiences could be perfectly natural if certain current theories are indeed true. I still discover things that I remember differently, things that I remember doing that never happened in this existence or vice versa. There are significant Mandela effects that are dissonant between my memories and those of the larger culture or historical timeline. Interestingly, things continue to shift like things that I have done since I woke up after that splitting episode, will change and disappear and then come back again like I'm jumping back and forth. I'd love to hear if other quantum survivors have also experienced this. I'm not asking for anyone to explain this away. I am a trained observer and an academic. This series of events has been an empirical, lived experience for me. I feel like there's nothing to do but embrace it as the way things are. Final Notes one advantage that I've had in this situation is access to good medical care. Since these things started to happen, I've had CT scans, MRIs, exhaustive screenings for mental health issues, dementia, Alzheimer's, brain damage, and batteries of other tests to rule out known psychological and organic causes. All concluded that I am perfectly normal, though I realize the term is somewhat limp in the face of how little human beings know. I currently run an intellectually challenging and rewarding program at a top university, maintain my long-term friendships, remain close to my family, am an author with several books and peer-reviewed papers. I have an advanced black belt and still run my own dojo. 
I don't mention any of these things to brag. Now more than ever, I realize how connected everything is and how little I have done on my own. All of these achievements rest on my connection to other people who have helped me, and the ideas and actions of an infinite web of people. But, such achievements are accepted in society as marks of a well-balanced person, though there are obviously notable exceptions if the news is any indication. I list the stable attainments in my life to challenge the notion that people who have these experiences are all unstable crackpots. I cringe when I hear the empty term, crazy. I think that people's experiences with quantum immortality are real and are significant phenomena that we should be paying attention to. I think that the implications are profound in regard to our understanding of life, reality, the universe, everything. I think that everyone here should consider themselves pioneers who've had the opportunity to actually boldly go where few have gone before. I hope people continue to share their stories. The reason it took me so long to fully embrace my perceptions, despite my confidence in them, was that I simply wasn't ready after all that loss to grieve my old life, and further, I literally had no framework from which to reconstruct my orientation towards reality. On this side of things though, I'm actually okay with everything that's happened, and I've started to understand the positive aspects of my experiences. Thank you. Okay, so it's file 1278. The Fatherly Time Warp Chronicles. You don't know why it messed up your head? Even if this happened to me, a narrator who's seen hundreds or thousands of stories along these lines, I'd also get the zoom in on my face of total shock and awe. <laughs> you know, I love how you put that. Even though it could be as simple as your father's soul being ahead in time by a factor of 10 minutes, that doesn't change how mesmerizing it'd be to experience this actually happening. He was sleeping, so a soul jump event is more likely. That or the glitch was from your own mind seeing buffered reality 10 minutes at a time. That can happen. Would need more information to know, for instance, if you heard a car starting afterwards, then it'd be foresight, as a soul jump wouldn't take the car, and the car wouldn't be there anymore. Case notes for the bonus file, when laundry machines go wild. See, your friend heard the noises through the phone too, which is very important. It tells me these spiritual events are not mere hallucinations or like spiritual interfacing into your mind. In other words, they truly do manifest in the physical world, enough to cause vibrations in the air, i.e. sound, that was picked up on the phone. It's a really cool detail. But the other aspect is the infrequency of the apparition. Now maybe they did appear to others within this time frame over a year, but it still surprises me. If I was a spirit, I'd try to manifest as often as I could. Maybe it's an energy limitation. These spirits do need energy to manifest and operate in the mortal realm. It's not as easy as just, well, I want to go see some, you know, my friend, so that's just appear. No, it probably does require a lot of energy. And the, the good, the more good you are, the less you want to siphon energy away from people. A kind of spiritual energy too, maybe not just thermal. So feeling cold isn't just the effect on outside air, but also internal. You're losing energy. Okay, so that's the bonus file. When revenge and the supernatural collide. The plausibility of subconsciously finding and pocketing your action figure is real. It does happen, especially hopped up on adrenaline and anticipation of revenge. Could the spirit of Sneaky Pete have helped you out? Maybe. It seems out of character given how violent he had been, or at least the stories go as the stories go. But even spirits might be able to change, or maybe he wasn't as violent as described. Maybe that was just the story that kids say. They do tend to embellish on details to make it more interesting. And of course, you're, you change your clothes before going there, so you hadn't accidentally found it before. It wasn't just accidentally in your pocket and you didn't realize. No, you went there without it and then came back with it. Yeah, something put it there. Maybe you, maybe a ghost. I don't know. Friendly, sneaky Pete the ghost. <laughs> Fair enough. And now time for the question of the day. What makes you roll your eyes every time you hear it? A few things. For me, one of the more annoying things is when people say we only use 10% of our brains. No. We use all of it just in different parts. It's like a computer. You don't use a graphics card when you're just on the desktop or barely at all because you're not running a 3D application. But then when you load up a game, then it, it's used. The brain is compartmentalized in certain uh, areas where some parts are responsible for others. Like for me, the visual cortex is overstimulated, so I always have visual snow, this tiny grain of film I always see. So that part of my brain is overstimulated, but it's not my whole brain, just that part. Curious what you guys think. What makes your eyes roll when you hear it? 
Okay, so let's find 1279, the picture that cannot exist. I think I will assume the role of the family photographer when I eventually have a family too. Sounds good. I have no explanation to offer on this one. Guardian angels don't take random pictures of the back of your head to freak you out or make you think of your mortality. It doesn't offer any sort of information on that, in my opinion anyways. It literally sounds like a true to god error of the simulation. Like information from a parallel universe infiltrating over here. But it's not a digital signal, it's an analog Polaroid picture. And there's nothing transmitting there. So how could that happen, I really don't know. Almost like two universes occupied the exact same space for that brief flash. And you know, while your dad was stern, he truly did love you. Wanted to keep you safe, protected even against minor risks. So, just remember that about him. It's very sweet. Even if it was annoying, I suppose. Okay, so on to the creepy file number 118. The Malignant Whispers. So right, picking up other voices from CB Radio, which by the way refers to Citizen's Band. I didn't even know that until I looked it up. It wouldn't even explain the words spoken, though. Or it wouldn't make them less terrifying. The last line of, no matter how hard you try, no one's coming for you. Well, that isn't just a threat, it sounds like someone being held captive by a torturous soul. And is it that, hearing words spoken in this home from decades ago? Spirits reliving a um, terrible scene? Or was it an ongoing crime at the time that somehow was caught in an active radio and transmitted to yours while yours was shut off too? That doesn't make sense, does it? Is it a kind of spiritual ripple in time? Maybe more likely? Since spirits have the juice to turn on electronics regardless of their manual setting, they can bridge the circuit. I hope whoever was trapped managed to escape, if it was happening at the time in real time or ages ago. I guess we'll never know. And now time for the quote of the day. Don't limit a child to your own learning, for he was born in another time. Rabbinical saying. Well, they do say that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And I think there is some genetic truth to that. We tend to emulate our parents, especially your, the one directly associated with you, like your father if you're a guy, or your mother if you're a girl. For me, it's definitely true. My dad is uh, very introverted. He prefers just to go camping over the summers and pretty much lives alone, does his own thing on his own time. But as far as learning, I think the most important thing is to teach your kids good values. And they're not too complicated. Don't lie, don't steal, be honest, don't aggress against others. And maybe honesty is the most important thing. No, the most important thing is don't be hypocritical. If you're going to do something, or if you don't want someone else to do it, you can't do it yourself because then you're being a hypocrite and it doesn't apply. You're breaking the symmetry of uh, ethics and that is very dangerous. So don't be hypocritical would be my core lesson to impart on my kids. But as far as what a kid wants to do, what interests them. If it's something that diverges from you, you know, the family trade, well, I think that's a bit archaic. Let them grow into whatever they find interesting. That'll be their purpose. Or at least enable them to find their purpose. Okay, so to file 1280. I dodged the Grim Reaper scythe. Right, quantum immortality stories never cease to excite me. Completely resetting your experience to a universe where the same mistake that you made in the first one was avoided. The tragic fate that befell you where you originally came from was spared. It doesn't change the horrors those you love will face, though. They still have to grieve for a loss they believe is permanent and irreparable. And for that, I still live very cautiously myself. Even though I believe in quantum immortality to 99.99%, I don't want anyone in this universe that loves me to miss me if I'm gone. Not to mention everyone who would be stranded without these great stories that would be unfortunate. <laughs> so I want to stay alive here to spare my friends and my parents any grief that may be caused by my passing. The wildest thing to consider is how many times it may have already happened though. I'd never truly know. Most deaths wouldn't be epic jaunts on a motorcycle or other high octane risky activities like that. It's sad in a way to ponder that angle though. If you've died many times from an illness or something, and you just never know. I guess it is important to think about too. To remember that it's important to not be too risky in life because people here still care about you and they may not know or believe in quantum immortality and even if they do, there would still be great pain in knowing that you can never interact with them directly even though they're off doing their own thing and they probably never even <laughs> know the difference, but you will. 
Empathy, I guess. Caisson's file 1281. My lost license materialized five years later? So are we convinced yet, collectively, that we have guardian angels watching out for us? It isn't just life and death shielding, not at all. There's absolutely no freaking way that this is just a coincidence. Just thinking of this as a coincidence like these comedic Instagram reels where a person you know is at home, about to go to work or something, when a ball bounces, lands on their face, knocking them into the bed, somehow pulling the cover over them, then bounces over to the kitchen and kicks the bag of Doritos onto their face. The perfect error. <laughs> it's not that. If that actually happened, obviously it's not some freak of physics. Nope. Some will is involved here. In this case, it's more perplexing because while there's no way it's a coincidence, in what way exactly does it help you? I can't see how returning a lost license does that, but maybe your guardian angel was seeing the landscape from a higher level than we can. Case notes of file 1282. Tinsel, eggnog, and ghosts. Plenty of reports to tell us that spirits can manifest openly in the material world, from moving objects around to multiple people seeing these spirits, or making noise sufficient to even be heard over a phone line. But here's the thing. Just because those things can happen doesn't mean that spiritual interfacing isn't a thing too. Heck, it may be easier for spirits to link up with a human mind, a human soul, than fully migrating into our plane. The latter, I'd guess, requires far more effort and energy to accomplish. These two spirits, lingering behind on Christmas, wanting a connection, but energetically tapped out and not being able to complete the voyage over here. But your buddy is there, spiritual Wi-Fi ports open, ready to interface. No harm intended, or freaking out your friend out, that's not their intent, I think. Just so good old chaps wanting a bit of human living on such a holy night. It's kind of wholesome in a way, but obviously, yeah, I'd be freaked out too, <laughs> and I'll feel bad about that. Okay, so for the bonus file. My feline angel's final cuddle. The question in my mind here is, was it the manifested spirit from your feline friend giving you a final cuddle, or was it your mind somehow able to glean information that your cat had passed, and created the sensation of this cuddle session to grant itself an easing over the loss? Either could be the case. I like to think that it was your cat's spirit directly. Spirits can travel great distances instantly, and given it was fresh, I'd bet his soul had tons of energy to it in order to accomplish the last necessary voyage to comfort his favorite human. It's beautiful. And now time for the quote of the day. Far better it is to dare mighty things, to win glorious triumphs even though checkered by failure, than to rank with those poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that knows neither victory nor defeat. Theodore Roosevelt This is quite a quote indeed, and I think it can be boiled down to, it's better to try and fail than never to try at all. And those failures aren't even a negative. They do checker your life, but in a good way. Without them, you wouldn't even know to appreciate victory. A lot of people are born with a silver spoon in their mouth, and they may have some success in life, they may try, but they'll never be able to appreciate it. So yes, live a good life, have adversity, and fail. It's a good thing. Case notes for file 1283. Hole in space-time versus heroic dog. I'm so sorry for your loss. Damn it. Especially in that brutal way. Anything that can harm a dog is pure evil in my book, or truly without sense. Thing is, this gives me truly eerie vibes. It makes me think about the couple of stories I read a while back about dots in space-time. Anyone remember those? One was small, and one was larger in a person's living room, and there were two people seeing it. And they're described similarly, like light is being absorbed, almost like a hole in space-time or a black hole. How I imagine the event horizon of a black hole would look anyways, but without the whole world-ending aspect to it. It's odd though, because there haven't been a lot of stories about it in a long time, and this is an older story from a while back, so I wonder if whatever was causing these holes just went away. Anyways, I'll take dragons, angry ghosts, space-time portals any day of the week over this. The emptiness described. Is it an actual entity? Maybe your dog's passing was from a different animal or unrelated to this, but I don't know. The impression I get from these is if you went inside of it, it would be true emptiness, and I think even your soul would be erased. I think it's total erasure. No quantum immortality from crossing this. Do not go in them. If you ever see one, just run away. Okay, so file 1284. Did I predict my friend's words? 
The feeling of déjà vu itself can be a clue to explaining this. It's possible that two minds, minds that almost belong to each other, become attuned, maybe even entwined, to the point of finishing each other's sentences and indeed thinking the same thoughts in unison. But the feeling of déjà vu tilts this. I think this was a moment you both experienced multiple times together, pulled from buffered reality. Perhaps it was a necessary learning experience, formative for your future growth together. I can picture this being discussed in the real world, where this is seen as a game, a heavy game, a simulation, but really the purpose is to learn about yourself and how you'd react in any given situation. But even more, reacting over time to different scenarios. And I think to ingrain specific events, repetition is required. Even if you don't always consciously remember each scenario, think about it. What's the best way to retain information? Write it down again and again, reinforce the mental pathways. If our brains in the real world function at all like ours in the simulation, then it makes total sense why you'd repeat the same scenes. Okay, so it's file 1285. Space time as a pretzel. To taunt spirits is never a good idea, <laughs> even if it doesn't lead directly to death. Why mess with an ethereal world that cannot be defended against? Even to be messed with intermittently could easily drive the sanest of minds totally mad. Creating an illusion of heart beating inside of a purse is pure horror. That's not a friendly spirit, let's say. You know, even if I was a ghost and being taunted, I wouldn't go that far. That's a bit creepy. <laughs> as far as the duplicate sister walking by twice or multiple times, space-time portals would be my guess, but it's not that hard to visualize. Ever seen a black hole? How it curves light around itself so you literally can see behind the black hole? Its own accretion disk, not to mention the stars and so on? It's trippy, but if you understand that time itself is part of space-time, it'd be a similar effect but instead for time. So instead of light being bent, it was time itself, within this localized area near the family office. What was going to happen was warped to happen earlier multiple times, per you and your dad's reference frames. To your sister, nothing was different. When you're inside of it, everything appears normal. Same thing as the Lorentz transformation for um, high velocity or near gravity, high gravity wells. You yourself wouldn't notice anything different, but time outside would pass at a different rate and uh, would pass much, much faster relative to time inside the high velocity area. Per your reference frame, everything would look normal though, which is not intuitive at all. And now time for the question of the day. What is something you're terrible at, but wish you could do well? For me, it would be singing and dancing. Yeah, I have a good voice for narration, but I can't sing. I don't have the pitch for it, I guess, but uh, yeah. It would be cool, you know. It's weird. I guess I'm a drawn to something that is so opposite of my personality. Being the singer and dancer that goes on stage in front of 100,000 people and just sings. There's a certain appeal to that, mainly because it's so foreign to me. That's not in my cards. What about you? What would you love to be able to do that just isn't in your cards? Okay, so let's file 1286. A physicist's perspective on quantum immortality. So I'm glad you feel this way now, knowing so many other people experience a similar, though not as extreme, version of quantum immortality. And it's true, they do. Thousands, millions of people. I mean, we probably all do at some point in our lives. So, really, billions. Also, I'm just so incredibly sorry about your parents going through an incurable illness and you having to help them out in that. It's just terrible. Even if quantum immortality is true, it doesn't change the fact that as the survivors, we don't get to jump universes with our loved ones. We're faced with the everlasting lingering here. Honestly, I don't have words for how sorry I am. So many bad things happen to you in such a small period of time. It's just truly really wrong. The bottle of pills is curious. If you had already completed the transition to a new universe, taking 60 pills wouldn't be survivable in any universe where human physiology matches your original universe. Unless we're like superhuman over there. Maybe in the new one, you simply took a smaller dose and flushed the rest in the toilet or something. Would explain why you felt terrible, but you still survived. You were going to go through with it, but you didn't fully commit. And both families not sharing your memory of the first meeting with your partner is very strong evidence of quantum immortality indeed. Sorry that it didn't end up working out. It does make you wonder if soulmates can change depending on the universe you occupy. 
If the differences in personality are pronounced enough, then I think so. And that isn't to say that soulmates have to be a total match and like you have to like the same things and think the same way. No, yin and yang. Sometimes we're attracted to the opposite. But if personality does change, it can mean that maybe she was more like you than you wanted. As for constant shifting, I think this could happen if your soul is jumping more than once. It's important to realize that in most accounts, there aren't many differences at all between universes. I like to think of the multiverse as being organized by differences. The more similar two universes are to each other, the greater their proximity. Just speculation, but my guess is, in a soul jump event, you move to the nearest universe where a copy of you that is still alive exists. Sometimes this would be far away, in which case you'd notice more differences. Also, it's pretty cool that you run your own dojo on top of everything. How do you have the time for all that? <laughs> Amazing. And now time for the quote of the day. A sense of humor is part of the art of leadership, of getting along with people, of getting things done. Dwight D. Eisenhower. It's not just a military commander, but in any job. Like if you're a manager for uh, even just a fast food chain, you know, Taco Bell or McDonald's or whatever. If the type of managerial skill you have is just being a dictator, in the people that remain, maybe they'll be more efficient, but probably not long term, but you'll get high turnover. You don't want that. You want to be in the muck with people, willing to do the same jobs they are, even as a manager. Humor can alleviate a lot of friction that can uh, accumulate over time, especially with uh, customer service oriented jobs. So yeah, you want to be there in the muck with your soldiers, so to say. Crack jokes here and there. Don't be too serious. It's a tough balance, but you, you want to be serious enough to get the job done, but also joyful enough and lighthearted enough that not necessarily be friends with those under you, but also just treat them like human. And having jokes is a great way to accomplish that, or at least laughing at their joke. Like the video, subscribe, hit the bell. Kinetic Symphony, signing off.